everyone and welcome back. Today I am moving on to the shoes for Gonzo's ensemble from A Muppet's Christmas Carol. And well, I thought I knew a fair amount about 1840s men's shoes. I mean, I know a fair amount about that time period in terms of shoes and just shoemaking in general. It can't be that hard, right? Well, uh, the moment I started doing research into the shoes in the movie, the moment it all started to fall apart quickly. See, I have an original pair of boots from the probably 1840s, right around that time period. They are women's boots, however, but they are very similar to the boots that Gonzo is wearing in the movie. They are a side lacing style. They have tan wool for the main body, a little glazed leather toe, and have the same general shape and style to them. The only difference is that Gonzo shoes have a little bit of a heel to them. And from what I knew of the 1840s era, that was typical for men's shoes, but not women's shoes. So I didn't think much of it until I started doing more research and quickly began to realize that, well, just about everything was wrong with those shoes that Gonzo was wearing might actually be the least accurate thing out of the entire movie when it comes to costumes, but it's not surprising because the thing is fashion history is really new as an academic field, only really starting up in the 1970s and being accepted as an academic field in the 1990s to begin with. We are still in a sense struggling to get it respected and understood and Places like the Bada Shoe Museum only opened in 1995. We don't have a lot of research on fashion history and we have even less on shoes. There is very little information out there and the information that I am able to put together comes from the fact that I have the vast internet to take from and that wasn't available in the early 1990s to the people that were doing the research for this movie. So I understand completely the hours of research I can put in are not going to bring up necessarily the same results as a quick look at museum pictures, a quick look at say what the v &A has to offer in terms of shoes from this era. Because here's the thing, shoes are very often displayed as a static object. They are sitting on a shelf by themselves. They are not on feet. They are not functioning. They are not visible in a lot of images of any time period. They are beneath skirts or in the bottom half of a portrait or a photograph that just never got done. So they're just not there a lot of the time. And there's very little available information wise on shoes. So compiling all of that is something that is relatively novel. And I'll be honest, the first thing that I noticed that was wrong with Gonzo shoes is something that would be really easy to find today. Um, but for that reason, it's pretty fascinating to me. The fact that they are on the wrong feet. In fact, side lacing boots should have the lacing on the inside of the foot. And there are two ways that we can verify this. We can look at original images and there aren't that many. Like I said, usually the shoes are pretty well hidden, but there are some, or we can look at originals that have either been worn enough that you can see the footprint in the shoe that they have been made right or left because at this point in time in the 1840s, straight lasts were more common, meaning that they are symmetrical and you're not going to have a right and a left until you've worn them a fair amount. But by the 1850s, when this style is still around, right and left is coming in. So we would have to have a pretty broad range of originals available to us to actually handle and look at in order to know what side this goes on or have the experience of trying to lace them up ourselves, in which case bringing your foot up to your knee is a lot easier than trying to lace the outside of your shoe. So personal experience, if nothing else has taught me that they lace on the inside. But all of that research is really hard to do without the internet, without a lot of information available to you. So I understand why that happened. If anything, it's just pretty quirky and adorable. But as for the rest of the boots, they are historically accurate, but not at all correct for the situation we are in. When I started looking up side lacing boots, I found over and over and over again, ladies side lacing boots. I couldn't find originals that were clearly large enough to be men's shoes. I couldn't find any sales advertisements that mentioned side lacing boots without also saying ladies side lacing boots. 
I couldn't find any imagery of men wearing them. Now granted, a lot of times their trousers are long enough that they are covering where the side lacing would be. So stylistically you wouldn't see them, but there's nothing that really points to it existing otherwise. So the absence of that visual portion of fashion plates isn't a sign that it is there. It just is adding to the fact that I don't think it is. So as of right now, unless I find other evidence, I don't think side lacing boots were a thing for men's shoes. They had plenty of other boot styles that laced up the front or were entirely pull on types. The Congress boot, as we now call it, the type that has elastic on the sides is coming in in the early 1840s, really popular by the late 1840s. So there are other options for types of fasteners for men's shoes. So we will get into, it took me a while to figure out the right one for this. But that element is, distinctly women's shoes from what I can tell. Now Gonzo's boots do have heels on them, which is accurate for men's shoes of the 1840s and would start to be accurate for women's shoes in the 1850s. Heels come back with a resurgence for women's shoes in 1851 and just take off very quickly. Men's shoes commonly have a fairly low, no more than one, one and a half inch stacked leather heel at this time in the 1840s, that's really common. So that's correct for the era. The shape, the square toe, also correct, though theoretically it should be a fairly narrow square toe for the 1840s, widening as we get into the 1850s. But since we are making these for Muppet shaped feet, I will give them a pass on the width of that square toe being more late 1850s than early 1840s. Next, we need to look at what it is made out of. Gonzo's are really fun. They have a sort of tan brown fabric on the back and that little glazed leather toe. This is something that I could find plenty of examples for those women's side lacing boot styles. Less commonly for men's though. I did also notice that all of these examples I could start to find for men of that style of toe had a much larger section of leather. It was lot, not nearly as dainty and tiny as the women's versions. So again, proportionally looks pretty good in the movie, but this sort of setup with wool in the back and the leather in the front limited me in terms of finding examples for men's shoes because most of the time men's shoes were entirely black leather. There are definitely plenty of examples that show some sort of gaiter or the trousers themselves strapping down over the shoes, but I could find a few examples of fashion plates that showed fabric and leather combined because the, the colors kind of gave away the fact that it was fabric. And because the trousers also then strapped over that, it made it less likely that we're talking about a gaiter or a shoe. And because you could kind of see the sole in some of the examples and because of the shape of the toe and all of those things, I felt like they were very likely to be that little cap toe at the end rather than two separate entities. So theoretically that exists out there. I just had to find examples that showed that. And that was easier said than done. The best example I could find is of this sort of tie top, not full boot, but more like an Oxford style shoe. It has wool in the back and the little glazed leather toe. And it has a side seam that I found at least one fashion plate that seemed to show that side seam. Again, we're talking really minuscule things here, but they put a lot of detail into those fashion plates. And so I'm thinking that might be what this particular style of shoe in this image is. The only problem was that this example that I found is likely early 1850s, judging by the toe shape and some of the construction methods as I will talk about when we get into actually doing the construction. I learned a lot about construction methods because it is changing dramatically and rapidly in this particular era. Shocking, I know. It's not like everything else was changing. But that shoe is probably a little late, but again, I found examples in fashion plates and other images that I think match up with that. And interestingly enough, I'm wondering if this is what we call an Oxonian shoe. I did find one plate that did show an Oxonian as more of a short boot, but at some point it had to move towards the description that they are giving it of a laced shoe. So and there are plenty of mentions of Oxonians in the early 1840s. So I think this style makes sense for that. It makes more sense to me visually than trying to do an entirely black leather boot for Gonzo. I feel like that just misses the market, misses the fun. Doing an open style pump just doesn't work well on the dirty, cold, wet streets of London. So I understand why it's a boot, I understand why it's not a plain black boot. I wanted to find something that would allow me to keep that essence to it. So that is the style that I'm choosing to go with. 
it's going to be an adventure for me because I have never done this style of shoe before, not just in terms of the uppers, but the construction. I have worked on men's shoes, but they've always been pumps. They've always been very lightweight turn shoes. I've actually never done a welted shoe before. So join me on this adventure where I get to learn how to make a welted shoe. I get to figure out what sort of methods were being used in that time period and all of those other details along the way. For the uppers, I happen to have a wool satin that while it's not the perfect color is pretty close and finding wool satin is pretty rare. For the toes, I'm using the leftover bits from one of my previous shoe projects, just barely enough for that tiny little toe, and the entirety of the uppers will be hand-stitched together. While sewing machines are coming in in this time, they aren't in common use yet, and the original pair that I do have in my collection, as well as the reference pair, are both hand-stitched. The actual construction of these shoes is pretty similar to that of 18th century shoes. The lining and the exterior are made up separately and attached around all the edges. The quarters, which are the back pieces, are then attached to the vamp, the front piece. Everything is bound in a silk ribbon, and it's a fairly simple construction, but it's meant to last. A lot of the extra things, like whipping over the edges and making sure that there's reinforcement at the seams, is done so that way it survives the stress that will be on certain areas of the shoes, the wear and tear that are on the edges, all of those things are taken into account when working with fabric uppers. Interestingly enough, in this era, unlike more modern cap toe style shoes where the toe portion is overlapping the body of the shoe, this is done in the opposite way. So the fabric is folded back and top stitched on top of the leather. This is done with two rows of back stitches. And this seems to be universal no matter the style. I found it really interesting on my original pair, which are women's shoes and have a much smaller toe in front and a little bit of foxing at the heel in back, that the leather extends much further under the fabric than you would expect. It serves not only as the visual aspect, but also as a reinforcement. That was less necessary with this pair since it's a bigger toe space, but I thought that was a great way to utilize a piece that was already being added as structural as well as visual. The side seams are done up with two rows of back stitches and filling down the ribbon, the edge, just to make sure it's very, very secure. And then six little eyelets are added, two on each side and two on the tongue of the vamp. Now I have to admit, I don't fully understand how these things lace up. This is not a system I've seen before and the originals don't have their cord anymore. So I'm gonna have to make some guesses when I actually put these things on as to how this is supposed to work itself out. But I used the proportions off of the reference material so it should be correct. The insole for this particular type of construction method where we're going to be adding a welt around is where the main structural stitching is going to take place. So it's going to take a lot of effort to get this insole up to what it needs to be. I'm starting by getting the general shape, making sure it fits the last as closely as possible. And once I have done that, I can get to shaping it and adding in all of the holdfasts and the stitching holes that I'm going to need for later. I'm using calipers to make sure that I have an even space the whole way around. The first thing I need to do is sort of remove the bulk at the edge. There are different ways of doing this, but from what I can tell for welted shoes of this era, it's typical that you have a square cutout rather than an angle one. Now I do have a tool that is meant to do this, but I really don't like this tool. I have never quite gotten a, the handle of how to deal with it. And for this particular project, as with all of my projects, I got a new tool, just one new thing. And for this one, it is a new knife. This is a type that is really popular and common in Japan currently for shoemaking. And I've seen it used for so many different purposes and it was perfect for cutting away the section around the edge. 
I am still using my finer blade for cutting the channel where the threads are going to nest down into just because I'm dealing with such steep curves around certain areas. Also marking all of my stitches before I get started. It's really important as I go around the toe and the heel area that these line up as they need to. You have a bit of a complex radiation in those areas since we're going around not just curves in the case of the toe, but an actual square shape. And I need to make sure that at no point on the outside where the welt and the uppers will be stitched down is bigger than the full size of stitch that I'm willing to make. So the inside of that little channel is going to require some very tight little spacing and I want to make sure it comes out correctly. This is all done before lasting, before everything else gets in the way so you can make sure it is evenly spaced. I also need to cut a welt strip for this. The leather that I was using, the sole leather, was far too heavy, so I had to cut it down a fair amount, skiving it and angling it down towards the interior edge, adding a channel as well to, again, seat those stitches so they are sitting flush with the edge of the leather and they're not bumping up, because reducing bulk is really the name of the game in this type of shoe. Because I don't have the foxing at the back of the heel, I do have to put some sort of reinforcement in that area. It helps to hold the shoe to your foot and make sure that as you're walking, it's not slipping off of your heel. This, I'm just using a Wittha leather that I have in abundance that is incredibly stiff when dried, but very lightweight. So I'm shaping it out on top of the last and letting it dry before I insert it into the upper. We're then able to get to the lasting portion, starting, of course, centering up that back seam, which starts higher up than it will actually sit. This particular angle allows you to get a tighter fit at the toe before you pull the back down. So first thing I need to do after getting the back in place is make sure that that front is centered up perfectly. Because of that little cap toe section, it really needs to be even. I need to make sure those side seams are even. I need to make sure the seam to the leather is even so I don't end up skewing my shoe as I go. This is one of those things on the originals that I have that is so far off and I find it greatly amusing that they didn't manage to get that remotely even. But once all of that is in place, I can insert the heel cup and get to making sure that the rest of the lasting is evenly spaced. All of the fullness is as flat and smooth as possible and that I don't have any ridges or bumps that extend beyond the edge of the sole. So that's going to be the key factor, especially around that square toe, making sure that everything will be flat in the final visible version. able to start stitching everything together I have to make the threads. The threads are in this case made up of five linen threads that are twisted and waxed together. At the ends I taper them down so I can braid them into a boar bristle and that functions as my needle. This is going to have far less bulk than an actual needle would because I'd need to double the thread and I want to make sure that the holes that I'm making are only as big as they need to be because the smaller the hole, the tighter the threads are together, the closer those knots are, and the less likely it is, even if one of those stitches gets worn away with walking, that they're going to come apart. These threads are meant to hold everything together no matter what. With that made, I can get to stitching the insole, upper, and welt all together. Now, like I said, I have never made welted shoes before. I have made randed shoes. 
and rands are very similar. It's just a slightly thinner piece of leather that then gets folded over before you get to the final step of putting on the outsole. But this part of the process is very similar. The stitch that I'm using here is the same shoemaking Sadler's stitch that is used for so many things for that reason of longevity it really holds because in every single one of those channels that we made earlier there is a little knot and that holds it together no matter what amount of wear and tear it goes through down at the toe we are also adding a little bit of a reinforcement thread this is just a leftover remnant and this will help with those really tight stitches to make sure that they don't pop through the leather later i did choose with this style to put the welt the whole way around this is not a necessary thing and I don't think it's as common in modern shoemaking, but from what I could tell of the originals I was looking at, it seemed like it was one consistent initial layer of leather the whole way around. There are other alternatives at the back where the heel area is, and we'll get into using wooden pegs to attach a lot of the next few layers, but that is one of the options to attach the first layer onto the back and you just stitch the upper directly to the insole without any welt there. So I chose to go with this method looking as closely as I could at originals, but there isn't one single right way to do this. I also realized in this process that I don't have all the correct tools to do welting, but thankfully my welt still came out pretty flat. There's usually specialized tools for making sure that it ends up as flat as possible along the bottom of the sole you do have to fill in the center section of the shoe, meaning that no matter what you do, you'll end up with a seam allowance that is just too bulky. So you can use cork or leather or wool to fill in that space. I'm choosing to use leather for the back portion under the heel area and the waist, which will serve as a sort of shank. And then in the front area, I'm going to put in a little bit of wool. I chose not to do leather here because I don't need the extra weight of leather under my foot and it's uh, more likely to squeak once I've worn it a bit. So the wool will help prevent that as well as keep my foot warm. The outsole, I am using a pretty heavy sole leather for. I knew that I would need to skive it down and trim it down, but I wanted to go ahead and get a rough shape for that. So I'm tacking it down and trimming away the edges roughly. I'm leaving a good quarter inch, eighth inch, at least around all of the edges, knowing that once everything is stitched together and properly connected, it might shift back and forth, and I want to give myself a little bit of wiggle room but you can see how easy the cutting of this portion is with that new knife. I am so glad that I got that. It works not only for trimming down the leather on the edges, but also works really well for skiving down the heavy sole leather because this stuff is way heavier than I need and much thicker the edges. It's going to be great for some future heavy boots, but it's a lot more than I need. And it is the lightest weight that I can easily get right now. This time I'm also adding a strip of masking tape to protect the shoe uppers as I do all the stitching. In original manuals they talk about using an extra strip of leather to protect this, but for me as I'm still learning the masking tape seemed like a much more practical option. They just didn't have it available at the time obviously. Before I get started on stitching the front I'm going ahead and adding wooden pegs to the back section. I don't have to worry about these coming through the shoe too far into my foot because if they reach the last, they will just swoosh out and I will add a final insole to cover them up just in case. But we're going to put a lot of wooden pegs into that back section to hold all the layers of the heel together at the end. This is just the first set. I am doing my stitches into the welting 
backwards. I'm going from the sole into the welting, which is not the typical way. I'm doing this because that's what I felt as more comfortable. I put my welt pretty tight up against the last. I don't think my last is the right shape to do it the other way. I couldn't get the all in there. I also don't have the correct all. So <laughs> this is what I'm more comfortable with because this is similar to how I'm used to functioning with this particular all when I'm putting on, say, heel covers for 18th century shoes and the like. So this was a decision to stitch from the sole up through the welt. You can end up with less perfect stitches this way, but because I'm used to it, it came out very even. I also realized at this point that this particular method of horizontally cutting into the sole requires cement. It requires a not water-soluble type of adhesive in order to make that work, which is interesting because in the early 1840s, that wasn't available, but all the shoes I was looking at that I was guessing were 1850s, there's Gouda Percha available. There is a rubber cement style of adhesive available. So I'm wondering now if that particular method of construction came about in the late 1840s as Gouda Percha was an option. That's something for me to look out for in the future. But for now, I'm just attaching everything using Hirschkleber, which is a water soluble paste, which means that there has to be a lot of extra attachment in there. So for stacking up this heel on the back, we're going to have to use a lot of wooden pegs to make sure that it stays stable and cohesive, even if it gets wet. And this can make for a pretty long process. I've got about five or six layers to this heel, so I've got to attach every single one of those, making sure that I get them well attached, and then I can go around and cut them down make sure that the heel is coming out the right shape, which let me tell you is the hardest part of this process, making sure that you're getting the right angle of cut as you go down, because it's hard to wait to the end to cut them all. On top of that, you're having to flatten each one of those layers out because you're starting with a curved sole. So you need to gradually get rid of that convex curve which means that the first layer of the heel might actually end up more like a horseshoe shape. And you can gradually make sure that you even out every single layer as much as you can before you add the next one. So hopefully by the time you get to the end, you have a completely flat heel that works perfectly with the cant of the shoe last as well. Once the heel is complete, it's time to start all of the finishing. I start by rough sanding all of the edges, marking out how far I want my trimming around the edges to be because I'm going to add a black burnishing ink around all the edges. It's a really nice finish and it actually creates the illusion of the shoe being slightly smaller than it is. But I'm going to go through, sand all of those sections, make sure that they are flat and even, glass them down with a little bit of broken glass, and then I can start applying the finishes. To the bottom of the heel, I'm applying a gum tragicanth, which will allow me to burnish and shine back up that section of the heel. I trimmed it down because I didn't like the finished look the way that the pegs fell. Then around all the edges of the heel and the sole, I'm going to add that black burnishing ink, which has to dry completely and fully. You can't do this on a wet shoe or with wet ink. You go in with a burnishing stick and rub everything until it shines. Again, this has to be done when it's super dry, otherwise it will just rub off. Mm -hmm. 